Uh, a couple of people asked about it. Uh, they didn't understand some of the names, some of the words that are in use. So I thought, right, we'll just have a quick blast through the various connection types that we've got that are solderless. Ah, uh, can I move him out the road again? There we go. We're talking about making electrical connections mechanically without solder. Now this is a hand skill. It's like soldering itself or welding. If you've ever soldered, nobody here that soldered picked up a solder iron and was instantly good at making fast, reliable solder connections. You have to practice. You have to work out that you don't carry solder on the iron. You have to work out that you have to heat everything. It's, it's a, a practice thing, a skill that you have to learn. With these sort of things that we're talking about, you can fix it exactly the same way as a, a solder connection can be repaired, these things can be repaired. You need, for what I'm about to talk about, some specialist tooling, basically crimping pliers is all that it comes to. In the pro columns, doing this is quite quick. Once you're good at it, you can be quick at it. They're demountable. Uh, if you want to take a board away, you can simply unplug it and take it out and put a new one in and replug it, rather than starting with a soldering iron to get things out which is much, much quicker and much easier. It's cool. If you're upside down underneath the layout with a soldering iron or soldering dripping in your face, it can tire you. It can make you fed up. Whereas with these boys, you don't have to do that. Automatable will become important in a wee while. You can get machines that actually do hundreds of these a minute, which is of no use to us at all, but it will explain some of the things about the connectors that I'll have to mention further down the road when we're doing this. On the downside, sometimes, particularly when you're starting using these things, reliability can be a bit of an issue. They're not always as reliable as they could be. It turns out, though, that once you get good at it, the reliability goes up. You need to learn it. As I say, it's a skill. You can't you're not going to start using these things tomorrow and be instantly good at it. You need access to the kit, you need the crimping tool, whatever it is, and that gives you a small cost, as does buying the crimps. They give you a small cost as well. So moving swiftly, I've moved, I've put him in front of my wee thing, but I've got to press to get moving on. There we go. We're going to talk about GST crimps, Japanese solderless terminal crimps, DuPont crimps, IDC cables, insulation displacement connector cables, IDC, RJ45 and RJ11s, automotive crimps, and a new one, mains wiring crimps. GST crimps is what we call a misnomer. It's one of these things where there's a company called the Japanese Solderless Terminals, and they invented largely the use of these terminals way back in the 60s. And since then, everybody calls them JST crimps. But in reality, they're not made by the Japanese Solderless Terminal Company. Same way as not every Hoover that you've got in your house is made by the Hoover Company. Right? It's just a term that people tend to use for these things. What's that? Oh, it's a G the board's got JST crimps on it. Mostly they'll be made by Molex or Amphenol or, or whoever. Now the thing about the GST ones is that they are metrically sized. They're one millimeter, 1.25 millimeter, 1.5 millimeter, two millimeter. Whereas the ones that we call the point crimps aren't there. Uh, what's the word? Imperial. Moving him again out the road. All of the, there we go, I'll make them smaller. All of the GST crimps have got an SH or a ZH or a PH or an XH or a YH uh, annotation. And that's what they look like. And you've seen these on boards, they get used quite a bit. They're not expensive to buy. Eight pounds 99 from Amazon buys you a box of 460 GST connectors. And I'm getting through this really, really quickly with the GSTs because the big problem with the GSTs is they are not necessarily 
going to fit Vero board. Right, these ones happen to be 2.54, but most of them that you buy are 1.5 millimeter and 2 millimeter and stuff like that. But that's what you know under a tenner buys you. DuPont crimps, again, another mis misnomer, sometimes called mini PV crimps. They are not 0.1 pitch, like strip board, like chips, chip legs, like everything else. And again, they're not made by DuPont. DuPont was taken over by some other corporation in America, which was subsequently taken over by somebody, which was subsequently taken over by somebody. There's been no such company in the electronics industry as DuPont. They make chemicals and that's all now. They don't do these things. They haven't done for, for decades. Right. The wee man keeps getting in the road of everything, doesn't he? Took me hours to arrange that. These are what we call pin headers, classic pin headers. They come in single lead, single strip, double strip. Some are 90 degrees, you get double strip 90. We've all seen them, we've all used them, hopefully. And those are the basis for the DuPont system. But there's also and line mail connectors, like these boys, where the wire goes in and a mail pin sticks out. Then there's female connectors, whereby there's a, an opening. And that's the crimping part, that's the bandolier. We'll talk about that in a wee minute. Lastly, there's insulating shells. Now, I didn't put a picture of insulating shells up here because the picture's too big. So I'll do it now. There we go. Our friends in China will send us for a fiver, 2,500 insulating shells and some pins and some sockets as well. They're not dear. There's a couple of tricks for the shells. If you're only using one pin or two pins, rather than actually commit to using the little plastic shells, you can just put a bit of heat shrink over them to provide insulation. And just by heating the, the heat shrink with your solder iron, it will shrink down and that will give you a pin. Use that a lot in development, particularly for breadboard development systems, because actually it's easier to pull um, heat shrink sleeve and it's actually easier to grab and pull in and out a breadboard than the little plastic connectors. And super glue, if you want to make a twin layer board, if you want to put two, two rows of pins, then you don't buy twin shells, you just buy single shells and super glue them back to back and you've got dual layer shells. And it's much cheaper than keeping stock of the, the twin ones. The part itself has got four different areas on it that you should know about. First of all, nearest the ground here, nearest front is the actual connector, be it female or male. The second part, which goes back a wee bit, is what I call the anvil. It's a little square section that's already folded over. And that is to make sure that the, the crimped connector holds when you put it in the shell. The next, the third area, is the bit that crimps to hold the electrical connection. If you notice, there's little bits of stuff in there to improve the electrical connectivity. Because I was doing this this week, I did a wee test and actually took one of these male and female and put them together in a little jig and put a milliometer on them. Not everybody's got a milliometer on, on them. That male-female connection added up to less than 1.8 milliohms. They're really, really good. If they're done properly, they don't present any resistance any impedance to the flow of electricity or signal. The last bit there is for strain relief. It wraps over the insulation that you're using and stops the, uh, the insulation from pulling away from the connector. And it also makes sure that the insulation is carried into the shell. So you don't have anything electrical hanging out the back of the shell to touch and hurt yourself on. And moving on, 
These are the tongues. And those areas with the red rings around about them are where the anvil stops. As you push the whole assembly in from the top there, it'll push in and that little tongue will rise because underneath it, there's a little lump and the, the anvil going in will push the tongue up until the anvil gets to that little square hole, at which point the tongue will clap back down. And from then on out, it can't retract. The, tongue, the, the anvil won't go back up the channel. Unless you want to demount one of these because you want to rewire it or it's got a soft connection or something. In which case you put a pin or the tip of a scalpel just at the, the tongue there and lift it. And by lifting the tongue, you can then pull the thing out the top again. So that if you make one of these up and you think it's not just to your own standard, you can lift it, you can remake it. Can't do that with a soldered connection. Now tooling for these. <clears throat> this is the cheapest way that I can see of doing them. These things are made, excuse me, I'm gonna give my, myself some headroom. These things are made for jewellery and for fishing. There's a pair of them there. Now, I didn't pay £3.10 for mine. Mine's cost me £4, but I got them by putting my hand on them. And uh, there's a place called the Number One Bead Shop in Glasgow where you can go and buy jewellery findings. It's only a, hab a hobby that I do at the weekends, boys. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want that bringing up in the questions at the end, right? But if you go to the number one bead shop, you will find these for crimping jewellery. Also, big rufty tufty fishermen use them. When I was a boy and went fishing, you had to tie knots. Not anymore, apparently. You now crimp things onto the, the monofilament line. And again, these tools are for doing that. And they will make a decent connection, but it's a big skill. It's going to take you 20, 30, 50 attempts in not doing it right before you get this to work. And once you've spent some hours on it and you've got used to using it, used to doing it, you will get them to work. I've done it. I've made them work. Moving on, there's these boys made by CK Company in Germany. They're called the CK 3005s. They cost about, I think, 15 to 20 quid if you can get your hands on them. I have had these for 25 years. I don't know if they're still made. eBay might be your best bet if you want a pair of those. Again, there's a skill involved here. I, I'll get very, very good with these because I've practiced with them. The most common one is what's called an SN28. And if you actually put SN28 in to Google, you will find lots and lots and lots of these. There's the SN28 tool. Personally, I cannot get on with it. Um, I have tried a number of times and I find that it jams, that I can't always get the part back out. I find I have difficulty with it. But that's part of what we're here about today is to explain that you should get your hands on some of these and try them so that you find out what's good for you. Robert, I don't think Robert's with us today, uh, but a regular contributor here, um, him and I had a long chat about these. He uses these daily, doesn't see past them. The thing that I use that I'm about to show you next he can't get on with. It's to do with like solder irons. We've all got a solder iron that we get on with and other ones we don't like using. And that's the way it is with these tools. This is apparently the best tool you can buy for it. I just kind of get along with it. I use this thing. The engineer, the Japanese engineer company make a thing called a PAO9. Now it's not ideal for a number of reasons. First of all, see that scissors action? There's one pivot there in the centre, that big hex nut is the pivot. And because of that scissors action, the, it's not parallel. And so you don't always get a, a really, really good crimp. Your crimp can be stronger at one side than the other. But I've been using these for years, never had any bother with them. They make first class crimps for me. Now, I'm going to have to move him to get down to my wee control again. 
the engineer people make two versions of these. The PA09 is for little tiny GSTs all the way up to DuPonts and a wee bit beyond, up to 1.9 millimetres. Whereas the PA21 starts at DuPonts and goes up the way to two and a half millimetres, which are the big grufty tufty Molex, you know, the uh, for connecting uh, power supplies in a PC or a uh, what do you call them? Floppy disks and hard disks and optical disks and a PC. They've all, they've all got those big two and a half millimeter Molexes, and that'll do that. Again, these cost money. Expect to pay twenty five pounds for a pair of these. They're good. They're worth it if you're using them, but they're quite a bit of money if you're if you're only going to use them occasionally. This is a set that somebody else put up. That's the SM28, that's the, an equivalent of the, the PA09. And this thing here in the middle is also made by Engineer. It's called a PD11 and it is wonderful. Except for it costs, I've seen them starting at 60 pounds if you want to buy it from Japan. If you want to buy them in this country, they start about 75 pounds. The set of dies for it cost 40 pounds. Serious money. Now, if you're a, like me, you're a hobbyist, you're not going to be spending that amount of money for a tool that you're going to use once a month, once a year maybe. This is parallel. It's got, there's a joint there and a joint there. So you get parallel motion, so it gives you a really, really crisp joint. I have used this crimper and it is wonderful. One of the things that I have to say, I've forgotten to say, or I'll mention it later, is that with these crimpers here, those two, the lower two, you have to approach the crimp twice. Once to crimp the electrical stuff and once to crimp the strain relief stuff on the insulation. Whereas the SM28 does the whole lot in one bite, which means you've got to put it in the right way around with the SM28 because the strain relief crimp is a different size. The other thing about the SM28 is that if you notice the die there for the SM28 is demountable. And it turns out there's a lots, lots and lots of other tools that use this same handle. So if you're going to be cute, you can go to Radio Spares or a Farnell or somebody and buy one of these and then buy dies for doing other things. I'll show you a couple of other of these crimping tools further down the chat. <coughs> Right, IDC cables, insulation displacement cables. Never heard of them, Chick. You have heard of them, you've seen them. There, they're there. Well, usually two rows of terminals and a flat cable. The reason that I mention these is that they go along with, oops, a daisy, my apologies. They go along with the, uh, the pin headers. If you've got a twin row of pin headers, it'll take one of these connectors. So it's a cheap way of connecting 16 things at a time, making a, a board that you just unplug and the whole board comes away in one. Plug it in and the power and the signals and the totties and the, the whole nine yards are all connected at the one point, at one connector at the edge. They're really, really useful for that. How they work is, if you look at the right hand uh, part there, you'll see that there's pins and then the pins terminate in what looks like two little knives. And those two little knives get squeezed through the cable, displacing the insulation on the way through to make an electrical connection. And they do that by having this thing put on the back and then the whole lot is squeezed. You can buy a tool for doing it, £8.70, £8.70 from CPC or Farnell, but I have to say I don't, um, I think I've got one of these lying about but I don't think I've ever used it. What I tend to do is I've got two little bits of wood that go into my bench vise 
with two slots in them. And I just put the parts between the slots, assemble it slightly, bring it up, and then half a turn of the, the handle and the vise crimps it in one. And it doesn't matter what width, if it's an eight pin one or a 64 pin one, I can always crimp it on the, the vise with just these two little bits of scrap timber. If you want to pay £8.70, uh, I think a tenor gets you one from Farnell that's got four or five different uh, inserts here. You put an insert in there to suit the size of the device that you're crimping. But again, a tenor, it's not an awful lot of money. Got to move the wee man to get onto that. RJ45 and RJ11, that's the connections that you use for networking. I'm going to move him out the road again because that's going to appear there. For Ethernet networking, it's an 8-pin connection. For uh, telephony, it's a 6-pin connection. And I've seen the 6-pin connection ones used extensively for DCC++, for the handset, for the controllers whereby you use a curly lead and the curly lead's got an RJ11 on either end of it. And you can just plug that in and take your controller with you. These are again crimp con connectors. But, and there's a tool for doing it. But it's that same ratchet handle. Wait a minute. That's the ratchet handle for, that's an SM28. And that's a ratchet handle for uh, these things. They're identical. They've just got different dies in them. Right now I've got a couple of them, but you could probably just buy a spare set of dies and do that. But then at £8.25, yeah. I have a theory. Let's call it Chick's theory. That every job you do is an excuse to buy a new tool. <laughs> Auto crimps. Not everything that we do is electronic, particularly in respect to model railways. There's lots of wiring. There's lots of mains wiring. There's lots of power wiring. There's lots of uh, droppers off of cables round about. And these boys are a great use, a great thing to be using. They come from the 1970s. You recognize them. They come in three or four different colors, green, blue, red, and yellow, depending on the rating. You get spades, you get bullets, you get forks, you get eyelets, you get uh, butt connectors, all sorts of stuff. And yet again, there's a couple of different tools for doing them. There's that fella there. We've all got one of those lying about. There's mine. And it's rusty as hell because it's never actually been opened in 20 years. <laughs> But we've all got one of those lying about. That get, actually, it's in you know, that toolbox that you've got that you never use. It's got all them really old rusty sockets in it. It's in with those. That's where you've left it. Uh, and there's also, oh, there's that bloody machine again with the dies that you interchange. See it? And the coloured dies suit the different colours of crimps, depending on the amount of current that you want to do. And if you're doing that underneath your board or your screw connections, that's a brilliant thing. However, I've recently discovered these boys. Literally, I was on a buying good, buying something else I didn't need, and I discovered this for £15, and I thought, yeah, that's, that's worth a go. Here's the tool here. When you, I don't know if I can put that up to my, my camera. When you camp it, the four, the four little faces come in and squeeze these ferrules. So what you do is you put a bunch of multi-core wire in there, put this on it and squeeze it, and it turns the multi-core wire into a single solid connector. That single solid ferrule will then pop into a terminal block or a screw terminal or see the plastic bit that pops off. That's just a bit of white, bit of colored plastic. You can pop that off 
take it down and use it to wire plugs. Have you ever wired a plug recently and somebody's been in in front of you and put a little brass thing in so that it's no longer just flare, flare sort of random wires. It's got this little brass ferrule thing holding the wires together. This is how they do it. <clears throat> this is from the, the advertising bump. You just put that thing over, squeeze it, it gives you this nice wee finish, which you can then use for any kind of terminal that you're doing. I bought them for a job I was doing. I had a, a couple of lights to light up my backyard. The backyard of the TARDIS was lit up. The guy that was in this house before me put these sodium lights in there. They were about a kilowatt each. When you switch the lights on, you could hear the whirring for your meter on the other side of the house as it started. <laughs> the amount of power these boys were taking. So I said, no, I'm not having that anymore. And during the lockdown, I went out, stripped these things off the walls and put in some LED, 10 watt LED lights. And the 10 watt LED lights that I got from, uh, I think it was CPC for a couple of pound each. Uh, 10 watts, LEDs, last forever, but they need some light mains wiring. And that was when I discovered this thing. And I thought, yeah, I'm having some of that. And it made a smashing job of doing that little bit of mains wiring. And I recommend them to everybody. Right. <clears throat> Couple of things to talk about. You need to have the connector appropriate to the gauge and type of wire. Not every type of wire is suitable for every type of solderless connection. So you have to make sure that what you're doing, be it JST or the points or IDC or whatever. IDC, for example, is of limited use with solid wire. You have to buy a special flat cable. Either the, the flat gray stuff like that, or the flat sort of rainbow colored stuff like that. You can also get flat solid cord wire and that's no use. Some do multi-strand wire, some do solid core. Now, do you remember about three days ago when I started talking, I said that some of this stuff is automatable, right? When you actually get these things, the points, GSTs, they come bandoliered on this long metal strip. I should hold that against myself. There you are. There's this long metal strip thing that they're all connected to. That's because they're designed to go into a machine. Right? The person that's actually buying these is buying them on a great big drum that's going into an industrial machine. And the industrial machine is going to make up hundreds of these. So the machine itself, one of the first things that will do is bring a knife down on the connector and bring up sides to make the connector be parallel before it starts the crimping process. Whereas your crimping pliers don't do that. So most of the crimping pliers, where are my crimping pliers, have got a little bit at the end to let you squeeze the connectors to at least parallel before you put them in. To the crimp. The number of people that say, I can't do this, it won't work because they put the wire in, they put the crimp in and they squeeze it and they think that's all you've got to do. You've got to prepare the crimp by making sure that the sides are either parallel or in a little bit towards themselves before you start the crimping process. And then once you start the crimping process, that'll go up, round and back down and in to catch the wire. If you start with them like that, when you squeeze it, it'll just squeeze them the wrong way and you'll get all sorts of grief with it. You have to prepare, you have to preset the, uh, the crimp, the crimpy, if you like, the thing you're crimping before you put the tool anywhere near it. The GSTs and the points, as I've already said, may need two bites of the cherry. You may have to crimp the electrical connection and you may also have to crimp the strain relief to get it to work. IDCs have got either a little bit of red wire down one side, and they've also got a little triangle on the connector to tell you where that pin one goes. 
Now, not only is that to make sure that pin one in that board connects to pin one in that board, but also the cable itself is designed to go into the connector one way. And if you get your pin one wrong with the connector, it won't mate. It'll the connector will, it looks like it's crimped, but it won't touch the insulation. So you have to get that pin one thing right on IDCs. And going back to the GSTs and the DuPont cables and stuff like that, there's a huge uh, temptation to, I've crimped that connector. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put my soldering iron against it, heat it up and run a little bit of solder into the joint. And that'll make doubly sure that I've got an electrical connection. Really, really tempting to do that. However, what it does is when you do that, solder will wick up the multi-strand wire past the end of the IDC connector, maybe five millimetres out underneath the insulation. And that then provides a weak spot. If this is a flexible connection, you've now made a weak spot outside your GST connector or outside your DuPont, and that will break. And even if it doesn't break, it will heat up when current starts going through it. So please do not be tempted to put a wee bit of solder on after you've crimped it. Practice. This is a skill, as I said right at the start. Nobody is good at it the first time they do it. The first one or half, the first, well, the second, third and fourth of these that you do, you are going to make a complete arse of it. The first one, you're going to crimp your hand and hurt yourself. Davey, wave to us, pal. This big macho story about going to the post office, never mind. Anyway, if you want to practice with this, making yourself up some jumper cables is good practice because when you make an ass of it, you can chop off an inch and make it again and then chop off an inch and make it again and you end up with lots of little short cables. Little short cables are handy when you've got a breadboard. I thoroughly recommend that you try before you buy. If you're going to treat yourself to some of this stuff, then there's there's 40 something people on here today and I reckon I know at least eight or ten of them have got this stuff lying about the house and they will give you if you want to play with it they will say there's some connectors there's some shells there's a bit of wire there's the various tools try the tools and see what one suits you you might find that by by trying you know rather than spending 20 quid on a tool and finding it's no good to you having to spend 20 pounds on another tool if you try it you can say i get on much better with that one than that one i'll buy one of those and play with it and that all that costs is a half an hour or an hour of your time now during lockdown it's difficult if this had been the uh, the 65 club type meetings i would have brought all of these with you with me and we could all have been playing with them for an hour but as it is if you want to play with any of these Speak to me, speak to Davey, speak to some of the guys in the, the, the committee and we'll set it up for you to visit somebody and have a play with it. Google and YouTube are your friends and now you know what it is that you're looking for. You know what IDC is, you know what JST is, you know what DuPont is, you know what the names of the various things are. So you're now in a position to Google them, to look them up on YouTube and stuff like that. And the only thing that remains for me to do is clear up the floor in my office. <laughs> Any questions?